This week, I finally got my hands on the new Necromunda book, Cinderac Burning. There's lots of cool stuff in this book, but I was specifically interested in a new campaign format. So in this video, I'm gonna go back to the core rulebook and the Dominion campaign and give an overview of that. Then we'll head over to Cinderac Burning and we'll see what the differences are with the new campaign. At its core, the Necromunda campaign system is very simple. You play games. From those games, your fighters get experience points that they can spend on advancements. Your gang gets some credits that you can spend on more fighters or better gear. You'll also gain reputation, which can open up some options like brutes or hangers on. During those games, fighters are going to get injured and die, vehicles will get damaged and explode. Winning games gets you more credits and reputation, but even losing will get you some. This does a great job of portraying the story of Necromunda. It all makes sense narratively. As we'll see however, Necromunda isn't always fair. For fighters to get better, they have to spend experience points. The main way for a fighter to gain experience is to turn up to a battle, to take opposing fighters out of action, and if they break, but then rally, and return to the fight. Each of those will give one experience point. The scenarios can give additional ways for a fighter to earn experience, but typically it's slim on the ground. Once they have enough, fighters turn experience into advancements, which typically are bonuses to their characteristics. This results in a bit of a quirk with experience. Your best fighters are going to be more likely to take out opposing fighters, and because of that, get more experience. Fighters getting better is cool, but credits can buy you bigger guns. The amount of credits you get depends on the scenario, but a typical game will give the winner 1d6 by 10, so 10 to 60 credits, and the loser gets 1d3 by 10, so 10 to 30. There are additional ways to get credits that we'll talk about later, but typically you get credits from playing games. There aren't any maintenance fees you need to play or taxes that need to be collected, so it's all profit. There is a high variance in the amount of credits you get, and you can't have situations where the winner ends up with less credits than the loser. These really are the core driver behind your gang, so roll high. The big credit sink is fighters dying. If a fighter hits zero wounds, and most only have one to start, then your opponent rolls an injury dice to see how bad it is. The injury dice is a six-sided die with two flesh wound symbols, three serious injury symbols, and one out of action symbol. A flesh wound reduces their toughness by one for the remainder of the battle, but they can keep fighting as long as they've got some toughness. A serious injury means they go down, but they stay on the battlefield face down, and can make a new injury roll at the end of the turn to see if they can recover. But they're vulnerable to opposing fighters making a coup de grace. Out of action removes them from the game immediately, and they have to make a roll on the lasting injury table. This is a d66 roll, and 31 or higher means they're badly injured, missing the next battle, probably with some stat penalties. 61 or higher means they're probably dead. Vehicles are in a similar situation, but have a slightly different table. On top of that, there is a risk of fighters getting captured. At the end of a battle, if you have no one on the battlefield, then your opponent gets to make a 2d6 roll, and on a 13 or better, they capture a random fighter that went out of action. So odds are, you are going to be losing fighters, and it will be costly. That will be worse in games where your opponent ends up controlling the board. And it's a valid tactic for your opponent to specifically target your best fighters in the hopes that they won't survive to cause trouble later in the campaign. Okay, those are the broad generalities. Play games, get XP and credits. Try keep your fighters alive. Now, let's look at the Dominion campaign to see what it adds. The main focus of the campaign is on territory. Every gang will start with a home territory that they can never lose. There will also be a pool of uncontrolled territories to fight over, three per gang. Each territory has a number of benefits for controlling it, Many will provide additional credits, some will provide free recruits, some will give free equipment, and some will increase the gang's reputation. The campaign is split into three phases, occupation, downtime, and takeover. During occupation, players compete to take control of uncontrolled territories. This consists of three cycles. A cycle is undefined, presumably to be adjusted for your own group schedule, but this seems to typically be a week. It doesn't specify how many games are played in a cycle, which is an omission I don't get. It does mean you can decide yourself how many games you want to play, but a campaign with one game per cycle is very different to one with five games per cycle. Since everyone has three territories and you're playing for three cycles, two games per cycle seems to be the right number. At the end of those games, all the uncontrolled territories should have been claimed, unless there were some draws. After three cycles, you hit downtime. The downtime phase is a moment for the gangs to take a breath. Fighters in recovery get better, captives are returned, and all the gangs get an extra 250 credits to recruit new fighters. It does suggest that this is an actual cycle, so no games will get played that week. Players who do want to play games can play some narrative ones where fighters gain XP and injuries, but no credits, reputation or territories. Honestly, 
I think I just do the bookkeeping quickly and skip ahead to the next and final phase. During the takeover phase, games are fought over claimed territories. Like the first phase, this has three cycles. I was surprised to see that only one territory is fought over in each battle, so one player challenges another for a territory the defender already has. There aren't any rules explaining how to manage these challenges, so that's something the Arbiter is going to have to consider. Again, it's not stated, but I would imagine two games per cycle is a sweet spot, which would allow each gang to challenge once and accept a challenge. So that's 12 games in total over 6 weeks of the campaign, or 7 if you take a break for downtime. Interestingly, at the end, there isn't a single winner. Instead, there are a number of triumphs that you can achieve. So the gang with the most resources is awarded Dominator. The gang with the most kills gets the Slaughterer Triumph. The gang with the highest reputation gets the Power Broker Triumph, and so on. All in all, the whole thing is pretty chaotic. A gang could win their initial games, get lucky on credit rolls, and go on a murder spree for the rest of the campaign. Similarly, a gang could have horrible first few games and struggle for the rest of the campaign. To make this worse, territories provide benefits, including more credits, which means if you win and take a territory off your opponent, then you're making even more money every game going forward, and they're making less. It really is a win more type of campaign, and after the first game, battles are going to get more and more unbalanced. There are a couple of factors that do mitigate unbalanced battles. First, we have how crews are selected. Although many of the scenarios in the core book allow you to field your entire gang, a number limited to 10 or less, while a few have a random selection where you don't get to pick the fighters yourself. Unfortunately for gangs on the back foot, this doesn't come up as often as they'd like. Second, we have tactics cards. The majority of the scenarios give an extra gang tactics card for each difference of 100 points. I'll have to do another video talking about the pros and cons of using these cards, but they are a bonus and they can help out. The latter section of the core rulebook is all about helping out the arbitrators, the people running a campaign. Although it doesn't outright say it, many of the tools in this section are to help out a struggling gang. House Favorites, for example, is a random roll, but has a bonus for those lower on the campaign rankings. The narrative scenarios in this section are very flavorful and can be tailored to give the players a fun and balanced game. It could give struggling gangs an easier game, or could bruise a gang leading by a little bit too much. To a certain extent, Necromunda revels in its own imbalance. It knows the game is unfair and the dice are proverbially loaded. This can really suck for a player on the wrong end of the campaign table, especially a new player who didn't know what to expect. Presumably that's why there is an arbiter to keep things fun. Alright, on that grim note, let's move on to Cinderac Burning. This is a super narrative campaign. A good chunk of the book is taken up with current events in the Hive, and the scenarios are all based on something that happens in the story. They all have a very clever sidebar giving the info you need to actually play out that historic event. The resources you're fighting over in this campaign are called sympathizers, essentially other factions lending support to your cause. This includes all the various guilds, the major houses, and a bundle of less reputable organizations. It's really not that much different from territories. You start with your own gang sympathizers, which you can never lose, and a randomly assigned one. These all have two boons, one that's always active, and a second that's only active during the Spark of Rebellion phase, which is the final phase. This is a nice addition that should reduce the impact in the early phase and supercharge for the last phase of the campaign. Like the Dominion campaign, it's structured into three phases. A setup phase called the Great Darkness, which lasts for three cycles, a downtime phase with a single cycle, and the Spark of Rebellion phase at the end, which is at least three cycles. Like the Dominion campaign, in the first phase the gangs get to compete for unclaimed sympathizers, and in the third phase they can challenge to take sympathizers claimed by another gang. I think the biggest change in the new campaign is your gang starting with 2,000 credits rather than 1,000. You also get 400 to spend on vehicles, as the campaign has a mix of Hive and Ash Waste scenarios. Anything you don't spend at the start is lost. In comparison to the Dominion campaign, you're getting your toys straight away rather than waiting for them, and that's pretty cool. Everyone gets to have fun rather than just that one player who's been winning all of their games. It does mean less to look forward to though, so there might be a lull in interest as the campaign goes on. In theory, it also means more miniatures to paint before starting, making it harder for new players. But as we'll later see, you could just as easily start with a single box and have duplicates on your roster in case anyone dies. The normal gang composition rules still apply, so you have one leader and at least half your gang must be made up of gang fighters. A typical 1000 credits meant you end up with a leader, two champions and a bunch of gangers. So with a new setup, you could potentially roll into a game with a custom selection of your leader, a brute, and four champions all loaded out with gear and skills, while your opponent ends up with a bunch of juves from their random crew selection. 
This isn't something that's going to happen every time, but the larger gang size, along with scenarios that have random selection, certainly means it can happen. There is, in theory, a drawback. During this first phase, the Great Darkness, gangs may no longer re-equip from their house equipment list or recruit fighters. Instead, they must rely only on the trading post. So you need to make sure you have enough to cover your losses. Of course, with 2,400 points to start with, you almost certainly do. I guess this is somewhat thematic, along with the pitch black rules for all the battles in the hive. Necromunda does have a reputation as a limiter. As gangs start on one reputation, they're looking at only one hanger on, and as brutes are considered hangers on, you'll have to decide between getting that ambot day one or getting a rogue dock to keep people patched up. I suspect most gangs are going to go for that rogue dock. Getting more hangers on will rely on increasing your reputation, which you do by winning games. Reputation doesn't do much else though, and even Brutes have a max recruit, so you're never getting more than two ambots no matter how much reputation you have. Most of the scenarios in this campaign have crew selection around 6 or 7, some of which are random. This is a drop from the minion, where it was common to see 10. A typical gang at 1000 points will have around 7 fighters. At 2000 points you should have enough to cover any gaps made by fighters in recovery. With the minion, occasionally you'd get mauled badly and end up with multiple fighters in recovery, and unable to turn up for the next game, which would then end badly for the fighters who did turn up. Indeed, a problem sometimes mentioned was the best option for a gang in a situation like this was to immediately concede the game to avoid further injuries, and then get their gang back to strength for the following game. With the 6-7 crew selection, however, and that 2,400 credits to start, there should be enough to cover fighters in recovery. During the downtime phase, each gang has to decide whether they're supporting Helmar's Imperial House, Lady Credo's Rebellion, or are trying to stay online for a little bit longer. Each option offers a benefit and gives the gang a 50-50 chance of getting a special character for free at the start of a battle. Each of the characters are very flavorful and look pretty useful. While you could recruit some of these characters with normal rules, just getting them for free is a great way of making the players feel like they're part of the story. It does require getting at least one extra model from Forge World, some of which aren't out yet, but for me at least, that feels like permission rather than a burden. The additional benefits are split between extra credits, extra XP, or extra reputation, which is quite interesting. The credits are the easiest to get, just adding an extra 1d6 by 10 to your income roll at the end of each battle. XP is an extra d3 if your fighter manages to take out an enemy leader, while reputation is an extra 1 if you win the battle. Right now, I'm not sure which I would go for, but the credits certainly seem easier to get. After downtime, you go into the final phase, a spark of rebellion. Everything goes back to normal, and as with the Dominion campaign, battles are now fought over controlled sympathizers. As a big improvement, there are actually rules on issuing challenges, giving priority to the gangs with the lowest gang rating. In this book, we have 12 scenarios, all teamed around events in Lady Credo's Rebellion. As with Dominion, six scenarios are in the random table, and the remaining six are special scenarios. All the scenarios seem fun and flavorful. Some of the scenarios are similar to the Dominion ones, but with some minor tweaks to improve them and added flavor elements. All in all, this seems to be a tighter set of campaign scenarios. Of particular note to this channel, the scenarios have suggestions on how to make them into one-off events, with the gangs and characters directly from the story. This makes a great way to get a one-off event game. Personally, I'm planning on getting one of the new Horus Heresy Imperial Assassins when they come out, and play out the assassination attempt on Lord Helmar. I'm also quite interested in the bar brawl fight. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Necromunda is not fair. It's more simulation than strategy, and the campaign system doubles down on this. Cinderac Burning tries some different approaches, and it seems to be an improvement. The scenarios appear to be a little tighter and better balanced. The huge influx of credits at the start will take some time to properly assess, but I think combined with the crew numbers of 6 to 7, it's a good thing. Rather than putting your entire gang on the line for every battle, you'll always have more gangers in reserve. Still, I'm sure in many campaigns, one player will surge ahead with tons of credits, reputation, and fighter advancements. That's okay though. Remember, there isn't actually a single winner for these campaigns. No one gets to lift the trophy at the end. Necromunda is about the experience. And the story of a battered gang trying to hang in there can be just as much fun as the one that wins everything. Cinderac Burning is the first of three campaigns we're expecting to see as part of the Arantian succession. It really gets you deep into the story with some very flavorful scenarios and the addition of signature characters that you get to play with. 
it's likely to be a wild roller coaster in the best of ways and a load of fun. If the next few books in this series are any way similar to Cinderac Burning, we'll have a chain of campaigns that could be played back to back for a truly epic story. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment.